Sheila Cole. Appreciated your comment. And um, really, I think I should also start dancing. <laughs> I'm trying to really fight obesity. Yeah. Um, one of the things I want to raise is um, the fact that um, we're seeing uh, people consuming high energy, uh, uh, energy dense foods. And that's directly related to fast foods. Mm. We're seeing so much of fast food consumption uh, in uh, developing countries. And it's ironical because if you look at some of the buildings, we have heritage buildings in Penang, and these have been converted into fast food mm. restaurants. Yeah. I mean, seriously, seriously, it's such an ir ir irony to see yes. that in Penang. And there's this uh, big wars being waged between all these fast food uh, companies, corporations, for example, Burger King and McDonald's, you know, they're offering all kinds of uh, different, uh, you know, um, um, burgers and um, sort of uh, fast foods. Um, so, so let's think of a different way of consumption, yes. you know. Um, slow food as, food as opposed to fast food. There's a movement. It's a slow food movement. It's a global movement um, that brings people together to think about um, eating in a sustainable uh, way that actually um, honors the producer, you know, um, promotes organic farming, for example, uh, promotes the uh, idea of uh, gardens in a city, yes. you know. I think those are things that we have to think about seriously for Penang. Um, Unfortunately, organic foods are very expensive. You know, we would all like to go towards eating more organic foods, but how can we make organic foods uh, mainstream food? How can we do that in Penang? I, th I think this is enormously important. We were having some discussions last night about the slow food movement, and I know there's, uh, there's other local interest on that as well. And I think it's a very important juxtaposition between fast food and slow food. And in, uh, in many countries like uh, United States, Australia, Canada, people say they haven't got time uh, to prepare food and to cook because uh, you know, they're, they're too busy. But what are we actually assigning the time to? Like we're, we're rushing around, we're, we're um, spending a lot of time in the traffic, you know, getting to and from work in the motor car. We're spending a lot of time earning money to pay for the motor car. One, one of my colleagues worked out that if uh, many Australians spend a whole day of their working week, one out of five, earning money to pay for the motor car, they could actually walk to work in those hours, do away with the motor car altogether, you know, earn less. And uh, because that motor car has a lot of hidden costs that we're not encouraged to think about. It's not just putting petrol in, it's purchasing the car, depreciation on the car, all those things. So we end up with this very busy life. Um, many of us busy, can't assign the time to cook a nice meal at home because we want to rush and watch a bit more telly, you know, sit down in, in front of the telly. But if we took the time with family, sharing the food, cooking it together, uh, the Chinese history, uh, other Asian histories of celebrating food, sharing food, cultures of food, uh, we need to really embrace those local things and not look to places like uh, North America and McDonald's to, to lead the way. It's a path uh, to destruction, not a path to the future. So thanks very much. Time for two more questions, and I have uh, one. And uh, uh, another one? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, yes. I'm not so much into raw fish from Japan, <laughs> or Kentucky Fried Chicken, or McDonald's, or yeah, even hogger food name. in Penang. Uh, your name? Kusu Hei. <laughs> I'm rather concerned you now with global change and all those things. And what concerns me actually is how do we go about these things? Now, the city of Georgetown is under UNESCO. It's got a lot of old buildings and everything. And you have to preserve it because it's under UNESCO heritage. You can't really do much about it. As one of the speakers said, when you put up something, a building, you have to think of the children. You must have a, you know, a garden or something of that sort. 
But what concerns me actually, you must think further, and this is in a way global, is involving how we develop our cities or how we develop our new cities onto places where there are no buildings, where you've got to start planning. But what concerns me is this very important issue. Who built those cities? Who approved those cities? Who approved the plans? So then you must relate to the developers, the businessmen, to the politicians. So it is very important that change must come in through the power of the people to insist that the government lays down strict rules, strict planning, that when you want to develop such and such a city, you must have the following, one, two, three, four, five, six. You cannot cut corners. You're going to insist, in that case, I cannot develop because I'm not making profit, I'm not making money. Now, I think governments on behalf of the people must insist that it must be to the profit, to the benefit of the public. It's not to the benefit of the developers where they're looking for the bottom line. We, our politicians must stick to that. This applies to the whole world. It must stick to that. Yes. So yes. I do not know whether you agree with me or not. Yes, I yes. That, that should be the thing. Yes. yes. All three together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because Thank you, Thank you very much. Last three questions. I'll have all three together and then I'll ask uh, Professor Kepong to give the comments. So yes, I had uh, uh, yourself. Yes, please. A visitor who's going to get more engaged in Penang, I believe. <laughs> Introduce I hope yourself. So, by all means. Uh, I'm Francesco Siravo from the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. I'm an Italian planner, and I wish I were more of a, a sort of slim Italian model that, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, Dr. Wu's granddaughter was talking about. Now, the real point I'd like to make, and I'll be very brief, is uh, we are all fascinated by your lecture, um, and um, I think it's, uh, it's not by chance that in the last uh, part of your, of your presentation, and uh, imagine you showed pictures of the historic town. Now, I think there are lessons to be learned from historic towns that, which are very much alike what the blueprint uh, um, is looking forward to achieving in the development of new cities. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a very important point because it brings conservation out of a purely conservative approach and tell us, tells us that there are lessons to learn and values to be preserved in preserving these historic compact cities. And Penang is very lucky to have such a city, such a model to look forward in the future, provided we do not spoil it. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Stand behind him, please. Go ahead. Get ready. Then we won't forget you. Thank, thank you so much for a wonderful afternoon. And thank you, Tony. Yes, yes and please. And thank you to my, my boss, Tato Anwar, for making all this happen and for creating the Wuliente Society and uh, this inspiring afternoon. Um, what we've been talking about is the need for an attitude change. Uh, in order that we embrace uh, the challenges for the future uh, in order to improve public health. And I think that that's both a rational choice as well as an emotional acceptance of the state that we're in. Uh, what I really wanted to find out was whether you could identify a few low-hanging fruit in terms of public policy initiatives that could build confidence amongst communities, amongst this new integrated way of planning for future healthy cities um, that could yield some benefits in the short term so that momentum could then develop into a, to use a cliche, a paradigm shift or a game changer and that kind of thing. I think uh, with the complexity of modern life and with the challenges seeming so overwhelming, 
I think we are all at a little bit of a loss. And I think in terms of public health, uh, perhaps the focus could be on things that are attainable in the very short term. Uh, and just the final bit is that I work for an organization called the World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action, which I think is uh, one of the uh, best ways in which you, know, you can take care of uh, another organization started by Dr. Yeah. Anwar. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Please. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Prashan. I'm a practicing medical uh, officer. And uh, I think they deserve a warm applause. Well done, uh, Dr. Kapoor. Well, well done. Right? And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anwar, for making all this uh, happen. My question here is I'm going to talk, I'm just going to ask you regarding colonization of the gut. Uh, three things to tell you. First and foremost, Coke Zero has been declared better than water by the Singapore government, right? Coke Zero, right? And number two, the White House has reduced the number of uh, the, the hours of junk food being advertised in Institute of Low and Higher Learning. And number three, in the UK, in a radius of 400 meters, they have passed a bill where you cannot open an, a fast food joint. Now, that's the first world. In the third world, McDonald's is fighting with KFC to open right in front of the schools. How come in the first world it is applicable and they can actually do it and they colonize our gut in the third world? All right? And my second question, childhood obesity, childhood obesity is a major problem because my interest is nutrition and childhood obesity. All right? And it's on the rise. Malaysia is number six in Southeast Asia, and, the f and sorry, number the, the, the fattest country in Southeast Asia, and number sixth in Asia. And it's only going to get worse. We amputate legs like uh, you guys eating char kway teow, all right? <laughs> Due to complications of diabetes mellitus, all right? Now, this colonization of the gut boils from two basic values war and health care. Without war and without health care, the industry of the world does not spin. So please tell me, in this third world that we live in, how are we actually going to move on? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks for those. They were all important observations and questions, and I'll, I'll make some reflections on them, and then perhaps we can take it up uh, uh, later afterwards as well. Uh, our first um, uh, uh, observation, I think, the, the comment that governments need to take some responsibility is enormously important. And uh, uh, I think that uh, Dr. Wu would have been delighted to hear you say that today because if he was uh, here with us, he would very clearly see a role for governments in this. And there's no doubt that uh, uh, governments need we need to call on our governments to insist uh, that, that our governments take action on our behalf and on behalf of the health of future generations. I mean, even in my country, Australia, which many people would think of as one of the healthiest in the world, there's now concern from paediatricians that children won't live as long as their parents because of the obesity epidemic uh, in Australia. So. The, what sort of future are we passing on? And we must uh, uh, ensure that our governments are active. Um, lessons from history, absolutely. And uh, I couldn't agree more that uh, uh, the compact cities, uh, the historical cities, were, were laid out and designed before there was the motor car. There was just the people and the odd horse and a few rickshaws and people were moving around. They were still doing it very adequately. And the, I'm quite interested in a UNESCO town like such as this to be thinking about how we might work with UNESCO to connect the heritage side to UNESCO's Man of the Biosphere program, because I don't see that connection being made within UNESCO, and perhaps Penang could provide an example of making those connections more strongly between heritage and sustainability. Um, Low-hanging fruit, I mean, certainly uh, I think often the opportunities are local, 
and uh, and I'm not sure whether you have a sustainable schools uh, initiative here, but working with school communities uh, and looking at plans for children to get to and fro in more active ways, rather than being delivered to and from schools in very big, uh, often black and air-conditioned motor cars and uh, might be safe for the occupants inside but definitely not safe for the other children and it's a major issue in Australia, I imagine perhaps an increasing issue here that kids are getting to and fro from school in the motor car rather than, uh, than using up their own energy stores uh, to come and go. And so uh, thinking about schools, about growing food, kitchen gardens in schools, uh, a lot of it can play out at that micro level and creates opportunities that can then be scaled up um, to the community level. And then uh, the, the final point, uh, enormously important about um, uh, the influence of uh, fast food globally and the, in a sense the predatory nature of uh, uh, major global fast food enterprises and the fact that they really are um, uh, going to have uh, uh, very unfortunate impacts for the, the health of people, not just in Malaysia, but in many um, uh, low-income countries. Malaysia's almost about to join the, the high-income group. So it's not, it's not just a first-world problem, it's not just a, a middle-income problem, it's not just a, a low-income problem. But Anwar, you would be well aware from the experience of tobacco control, another major initiative that uh, countries like mine in Australia, now very low tobacco smoking rates, but burgeoning rates uh, in uh, low and middle income countries. So uh, together we have to realise that when we get good at things, uh, that you may get unintended consequences of they just start marketing and promoting their goods uh, in other places. So that's where global governance and the global compact on uh, tobacco, for example, we need to be thinking about how we can work together across nations, and clearly that the United Nations has a has a role in that. But uh, no doubt, uh, enormously important local action, but uh, needs strong global governance as well. So, thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, the professor. Uh, he he titled his talk with a four H's here. Yeah? Just, and he's covered them uh, brilliantly. And I would like to add uh, four that actually have come out of that, uh, which would be useful platforms for us to move forward. One is, I think, another age called holistic. And that if we want to make transformational change like this, then we really need to engage uh, in a way in which people see the connectivity and people see the long-term consequences of whatever they are doing. Too many people thinking in silos, too many think only of their own uh, special interest, and uh, very often their special interest is money, money, and money, unfortunately. Uh, the other three H's is that if you're going to make transformational change, uh, we need three kinds of H's. One is the head people, the H, yeah? there will be people who have uh, the knowledge that we need, the knowledge that coming from many, many different places, uh, and knowledge also with wisdom. We need also the heart people, the people sweat, you know, passion, prepared to challenge the systems and so on, because like Mulente, uh, he had that passion. He didn't have to do many of the things that he did. He could have lived a comfortable life and stayed in England and became a professor and retired as uh, uh, the principal of Cambridge University, maybe. You know, whatever it was. But he didn't. He came, he challenged the system. So we need people with that edge, yeah? the heart people who are prepared to challenge. And thirdly, of course, we can have the brightest people and we can have the most passionate people but we cannot change it without people, we call, I call them the hand people, people who know how to get things done. Yeah? And so we have to learn how to connect uh, these people who can make change, who know how to organize, who know how to make systems uh, transform. So um, these three H's I hope will be uh, uh, the second phase of our work and that we will build this community uh, that thinks holistically, that brings together head people, heart people, and uh, hand people together. And uh, Tony will cooperate with Penang over the next few years. We have taken him to the university. We have taken him to a number of the think tanks uh, already, to some of the medical institutions. And we hope uh, this is only the beginning for the future. So join me in thanking him very much for this beginning. Yes, thank you.
Thank you, everyone, for all the interesting questions posted. Before we end the event, we would just like a small group photo. So we would like to invite Ms. Oe to join Professor Capon and Dr. Anwar on the stage, Dr. Alex, professors, for a group photo.